All right, welcome back boys and girls. Today we're gonna to talk about making measurements in science and we're gonna talk about two vocabulary words that you might think are the same, but they're actually different to scientists. They are accuracy and precision. So let me define them and then I'm gonna give you an example by using um, a bow and arrow and a target and then we're gonna give a real example of a, la a set of laboratory experiments, which I hope will clear things up for you. So first of all, accuracy is how close a measurement is to its accepted value. How close a measurement is to its accepted value. Precision is how close a series of measurements are to each other. So precision, once again, how close a series of measurements are to each other. Accuracy, how close a measurement is to its accepted value. So let's say I wanted to find the length of this Apple pencil. I'm not sure what the accepted value for the length of an Apple pencil is. I suppose I, I could look it up. But if I had a ruler, I could measure its length. And how close I got to that accepted value would be my accuracy. Now, if I had a series of measurements, let's say I made that measurement four times, and you tried to use the ruler the same way each time, how close the series of measurements were to each other would be the precision. Now, we would hope that um, our precision would be excellent. We would hope we would get the same measurement every time. And we'd also hope that it would be accurate, that I'd be really, really close to the accepted value if I were careful. So, let me give you an example using um, a target and some arrows. So let's say an arrow hitting the center of a target is accurate. Of course, that means it's accurate. It's a bullseye, right? All right, let's say we shoot three arrows at the target and not one of them hit the bullseye. Obviously, I have poor accuracy, but notice that my arrows are very close together. My sets, my, my series of measurements are very close together. So I'm precise, yet I'm not accurate. In the third scenario here, this third target, here obviously I'm very accurate. I hit the bullseye each time with my three arrows and, um, well, I hit it each time with my three arrows. I am accurate and I am precise. Now on the last target, you can see I'm obviously not accurate, although some might say that my accuracy is not too bad if I took an average. But let's just take a look at the arrows by themselves. Obviously, not one of them hit the bullseye, so I did not get the accepted value. Um, and I'm not precise because they're all over the target. Now, how could one argue that if I took an average, I might be accurate? Well, if I took an average between these two and this one up here, I might be somewhere over here on this part of the target, so my average of the measurements might not be that bad. But in my analogy with the target, no, I'm not accurate. So, when we make measurements in the laboratory, our accuracy is determined by the measuring instrument that we use. So the instrument used. Um, in the laboratory, we have two types of balances. Uh, we have one balance that measures um, an object's mass to the nearest hundredth of a gram. Now, well, those cost about $150, maybe $200. There's another set of balances in the lab. They have little doors on the side so that air can't pass through when you're measuring the object's mass. They cost close to $2,000, and they can measure the object's mass to the nearest 10,000th of a gram. So obviously, the balance that costs more, the one that can measure the mass to the nearest 10,000th of a gram, will be, we would hope, more accurate. Now, the precision is determined by you and how well you use that measuring instrument. So if you carefully make the measurement each time the same way, you should be precise. If you're sloppy when you make your measurements, then the precision 
will be off. So you determine the precision. The accuracy is determined by the instrument that I'm allowing you to use. Now, let's take a look at three students that they performed an experiment to find the density of sucrose table sugar. Now it turns out the accepted value for the density of sucrose is 1.59 grams per cubic centimeter. Now let's take a look and see what student A did. She performed the experiment three different times and she got 1.54 grams per cubic centimeter, 1.60, and 1.57 grams per cubic centimeter. If we add these up and divide it by the number of trials, we get an average of 1.57. Hmm. What do you think? Was that student accurate? Yeah, I would say so. They got pretty doggone close to the accepted value. Were they precise? Let's see. Precise means how close a series of measurements are to one another. So it looks like my high was 1.60, my low was 1.54. It looks like my range was 0 0.06. One way that scientists can use uh, to determine precision is we would take the range and divide that by 2. So my range is 1.54 is the low, 1.60 is the high, my range is 0 0.06. If I divide that by 2, I end up with something called plus or minus 0 0.03. That means, kiddos, if I took my average and I added 0 0.03 to it, I would get pretty close to the high measurement. If I took my average and subtracted 0 0.03 from it, I would get pretty close to my low measurement. So my range divided by 2 with a plus or minus sign in front of it is a good way to determine how precise we are. This isn't that bad. I'm off by 0 0.03 on the high side and 0 0.03 on the low side. Let's take a look at the second student and see what she did. She got 1.40 on the first experiment, 1.68, 1.45 for an average of 1.51. So the average, that's eh, not too bad. It's not as good as the first student, but it's not too bad. How about their precision? Let's see. Oh dear. They're all over the place, right? Um, this one's 0.19 lower than the accepted value. This is 0 0.09 higher than the accepted value. My range, let's see, 1.40 to 1.68, that would be 0.28, I believe, divided by 2 is plus or minus 0.14. So if I took 0.14, that would get me close to my high value. And if I, excuse me, if I added 0.14 to my average, I would get close to my high value. If I subtracted 0.14, that would get close to my low value. So obviously this student's precision is much worse than student A. Let's take a look at student C. Student C got 1.70, the first trial, 1.69. 1.71 the third trial for an average of 1.70. So obviously the accuracy of student C was the worst of the three. Let's take a look at their precision. Now once again, it, precision is going to be how close a set of measurements are to each other. So if I look at my range here, my high is 1.71, my low is 1.69, so my range is only 0 0.02. If I divide that by 2, I get plus or minus 0 0.01. So while this student may not have been very accurate, they were pretty darn precise. Okay. So maybe in this particular case, uh, there was something wrong with the measuring instrument that they were using, but they were being very careful when they were making those measurements because they got the same result each time. So once again, this student over here was accurate and fairly precise. This student, student B, was not accurate and not precise. And student C, well, they weren't very accurate, but they did uh, have very nice precision. Okay, well hopefully that helps you understand a little bit more about the differences between accuracy and precision. The last thing I want to talk about today is getting into a little bit of math. In this class, you will be required to have a calculator. You need to have a scientific calculator. The one that I'll be using in the classroom is this one here. I like it because it's backlit. And when I use the document camera in class, you can see the numbers that I 
punch in quite easily uh, when I zoom in with my camera. Now this happens to be a TI-84 Plus C Silver Edition. You do not need to have that calculator, but you need, do need to get a scientific calculator. You can find those for about $10. Um, a graphing calculator is preferred because that is going to be similar to the one that I'll be using in my class. But if you can't get one, that's fine. Just make sure you get a scientific calculator and it will say scientific calculator on it. Now, a lot of students will like to use their cell phones. I need to warn you about that. On an exam or a quiz, you may not have your cell phones out. You may not use your cell phone's calculator. Do not do it on an exam or a quiz. You can do it for homework, that's fine. You can do it in the lab, but for an exam or a quiz, all cell phones need to be put away. So make sure that you get a hold of a scientific calculator. You're gonna need one for this class. Now, the only thing I wanna show you today is how to do something called scientific notation. It's a way to express very, very big or very, very small numbers in a simple way. You probably learned about this either in junior high or maybe at the tail end of elementary school. What we do is we take this big number, 245 million, and we express that as um, a number between 1 and 10. Well, the number I'm going to choose between 1 and 10 will be 2.45. See, it's this number between 1 and 10, 2.45. Now, obviously, 2.45 does not equal 245 million. I understand that. So we're going to multiply that by a power of 10. So what power of 10 do we need to multiply 2.45 by to equal 245 million? Well, let's see how far we had to move our decimal place in order to make it 2.45. So here's where my decimal place began. I had to move it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 places. So 2.45 times 10 to the 8th is equal to 245 million. This is just an easier way to express that big number. Once again, I chose a number between 1 and 10, 2.45 that represents this number, and then I multiplied it by a power of 10 to equal this number. I got my exponent by simply counting over the number of places I had to move my decimal to get my 2.45. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So I multiply that by 10 to the 8th, and now these two numbers are equal to each other. What about a really, really small number? Well, what would I choose here? What would my number between 1 and 10 be? Yeah, if you said 3.4, very good, times 10 to some power. Now this time I have to move my decimal in the other direction. How many places? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 places. Now obviously that's not going to be 10 to the positive 10th. Since this is a number smaller than 1, it's going to be 10 to the negative 10th. So 3.4 times 10 to the negative 10th is equal to this number here. Once again, I chose a number between 1 and 10. I chose 3.4, and I had to count over how many places to the right I moved my decimal to make that 3.4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oop, look, I made a mistake. That shouldn't be to the negative 10th. I think that should be to the negative 11th. So let's count again, make sure we did it right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Sure enough, Mr. Hummer made a mistake. That should be 3.4 times 10 to the number uh, to the negative 11. Okay, you try the next two. So pause the video, try the next two on your own. Then I'll do them for you. We'll see how you did. All right, you're back. So for letter C, did you choose 6.02 times 10 to the, let's see, 3, 6, 9, 10, sorry, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 16, 17. Did you get 6.02 times 10 to the 17th? Let's check because you know I've made mistakes in the past. 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 16, 17. Yep, I'm pretty sure that's 6.02 times 10 to the 17th. That equals this big old number here. 
All right, how about 10.0045? Well, the number I'm going to choose between 1 and 10 to represent this number is not going to save me a lot of ink. Um, I'm going to end up writing 1.00045. So I'm still writing that number. I just scooted the decimal over one place to the left, so it's 10 to the first. So in this case, I probably would not use scientific notation to represent that number. I would just write this number down. This is sort of a waste. But nevertheless, this would be this number expressed in scientific notation form. All right, how about 0 0.14? Did you guys choose 1.4 times 10? Looks like I had to move it over one place to the negative first. And this is another situation where using scientific notation probably is not very helpful. Um, we'd probably just write this number as it's written down. We probably would not use scientific notation for a number like that. But when they're really, really big, like these two, or really small, scientific notation is helpful. All right, hopefully that helped and you enjoyed your lesson today. Next time we're going to talk about significant figures. Make sure you bring your thinking caps with you. It's an important concept this year we're going to refer to over and over again. So be ready for our next lecture. See you then. Bye-bye.